Hey everybody, thanks for showing up here to XR Creators. We really appreciate you showing up today. Um, I am John White, and along with Don Shell, who's staying over here in the corner, and Mia, who I don't think can maybe make it today. Um, we are XR Creators. Um, you can follow us on YouTube, uh, you can follow our Discord channel, you can follow the Altspace channel, you can follow us in pretty much any social media outlet <coughs> if you can go find us for XR Creators. Um, so I'm very pleased to announce that Todd's going to speak today. He's going to talk about uh, Nemotechnics, um, which I'm pretty excited to hear about. Um, Todd is um, the admin for a couple of different um, user groups in, in Colorado. Um, one of them's a VR AR group, and the other one's a, um, uh, not Unity, what am I thinking of? Unreal. Uh, Unreal, Unreal, Unreal Engine group in Boulder, Colorado. Um, Todd is a hobbyist in VR, and he day-to-day uh, -day does database administration. So if everybody can join me in welcoming Todd to the stage with a round of emoji applause or hearts or whatever you'd like, um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for showing up, and I'm going to give the stage to Todd now. Thanks, John. Well, welcome, everyone. I uh, should appreciate taking time out of your day to, to join us from around the world, wherever you're at. Um, I'm coming at you from the basement in uh, Aurora, Colorado. Um, it's extremely windy outside, so if you hear something fall in the background, it's either I hit something or something fell over. So um, there's that. A lot of fences are blowing down around here, if you can believe it. So today's presentation is going to be on Nemo Technics in VR. So a little bit about me. Uh, as John said, I work with databases for a living. I've been using uh, data and databases for over 20 years now. And that's my, my full-time day job. But in the evening, I like to play with Unreal Engine uh, mainly, and I like to do a lot of different things in virtual reality with both desktop versions and with um, the, the mobile versions. Um, as you can see, I have an addiction to Oculus. I have everything except the, uh, the Rift S because my CV1 is still working great, and that's what I'm using right now. Uh, to give this presentation. Um, I've built a lot of things, really got started with Gear VR. I bought a Samsung S6 phone just so I could do Gear VR. So that's where I really started getting into uh, building things uh, for myself and, and for others. I do lead uh, COVAR, the Colorado Virtual and Augmented Reality Group. Uh, we have a, a wide variety of people who come to our group. Uh, we have developers, we have people who are just interested in VR, people who don't have a headset, who want to come and get their recommendations and all that kind of stuff. I also lead the uh, Denver Boulder Unreal Engine Group. Um, we've been meeting uh, virtually, as probably many of you um, have been, um, instead of in person, but we hope to uh, get that started back up uh, probably next month, because um, it's really hard to um, show people VR headsets virtually. I know that sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but. Um, you know, so we're going over how we're going to handle that, meaning, you know, hyper clean all the uh, headsets because people are paranoid about putting any kind of headset on that somebody else has touched. So we're looking at using the one use disposable liners, uh, Clorox wiping all of the, uh, the uh, controllers and stuff like that. So we know not everybody's going to still want to touch things, but, you know, if you want to see a new fancy headset, you've got to be able to put it on somehow. And then I do have a side hustle. Um, it's called a, a zoneofhope.com right now. It's just me. And uh, you'll see uh, an example of, uh, of some of the work I do with that. Um, since this is a, a pretty, you know, fairly small uh, group, we're going to go, I'm going to go through uh, the entire slide deck and then we'll um, go through a period of, um, of Q&A. So if you wouldn't mind um, holding your questions um, until then, uh, that'd be uh, much appreciated. So why bother memorizing anything today? I mean, can't we just go look it up? And the story I like to use is, um, is one of a, of a surgeon. So let's say you need to have um, a knee surgery. Do you want the, the, your surgeon to be the, the old guy who has still hands um, that has done the operation a thousand times, or would you rather have Doogie Hauser? Somebody really, really smart, but they've got mad internet search skills, but hasn't performed the operation. You know, you think about that. It's like, well, I want the experienced old guy with the steady hands. I don't want some guy who can just look it up real quick. So 
you do have to have you know some memories. You do have to have some learning um, uh, in order to really perform your craft well. So interestingly enough, is that over time of all the mind palaces and what is a mind palace, and we'll we'll get to that. Of all the mind palaces that I've ever built, um, just the architecting of it, just designing it, is a highly creative uh, process, and it does bring creativity and imagination to the forefront. And what's interesting and what I found is that memory mind palaces build on one another. You think about things that you built years ago, and that is one of the ways to make memory resilient is you practice recall over time, uh, recalling the memory, either you know walking through virtual reality, which we'll get to, or just being able to do it away from the computer. Anything you can do to help strengthen that memory um, with recall. So uh, just so you guys know, everyone here, um, I'm in my early 50s. Um, I'm not experiencing any cognitive decline, but believe it or not, with modern technology, if I take care of my body, eat well, exercise, all that kind of good stuff, there's an excellent chance many of us in this room are gonna live to be 100 or more. So, you know, you think about that, um, you know, so building resilient memories now is going to help with your mental health later down the line. So things I'm building for myself today, I'm going to be using 25, 50 years into, into the future. So it's an interesting way of staying mentally sharp instead of trying to do puzzles all the time. Um, so it's a very highly creative process. So the oral culture, written culture, XR culture, Believe it or not, um, Lynn Kelly, and we'll talk about her book here in a moment, she found out through um, research uh, through uh, anthropologists and through digging up artifacts and relics is that people around the world, ancient cultures, used mind palaces. They discovered it on their own. And so many people, even before the written word, used a lot of mnemonic tricks and devices to actually come up with ways of memorizing and encoding information that they could then share and transmit to, to other people. Then obviously with the written word, um, the need to memorize things really began to decrease because why memorize it when you can just go write it down in a manuscript or a book or, or whatever. And now we're reaching at the cusp of a new age where I'm calling it XR culture, where we're building uh, memory devices using all the different kind of virtual reality technologies, augmented reality and such, that we're building things that's gonna keep with us that were created digitally, but are going to uh, affect our mind and our, and our brains over time. So it is an exciting time to uh, be working with these technologies. So what exactly is mnemotechnics? What, is that, what does that really mean? This is straight out of uh, Wikipedia, and it's really about memory cues, things that you can use to help you encode information to make it much easier to, to recall the information over time. And it, the trick is getting it into long-term memory. The average brain can hold anywhere from five to seven items uh, in your short-term memory. But in order to get it to long-term memory, it's got to persist in short-term for an extended period of time, and then it slowly gets transferred into long-term memory. And it's not a one and done thing. Um, it does take time for that process um, to occur. And it is both an art and it is also a science. It takes time to figure these things out. I have a, a bookshelf full of uh, books about the human brain, memory, a lot of different memorization techniques, more techniques than they can shake a stick at. And they go by these crazy names, the PEG system, the link system, the PAO, meaning person action object, and then finally, the grand idea of them all is what's called the, the mind palace. So this last point is that you build something and then you wield it. So think of it as you're, you're building a tool and then you're practicing wielding that tool in a variety of circumstances over time. And you get better and better at it. Now, can I memorize a deck of cards in 30 seconds? No. But um, I am at the point where I feel like I'm coming to the top of the hump where it's, it is getting easier for me to uh, memorize more and more content. So out of all the books that I have on my bookshelf, if I had to recommend only one book that you read, this would be it by, by Lynn Kelly. 
This is called Memory Craft. It just came out um, this year. And uh, some of you, just uh, with a show of uh, emojis, have you guys ever heard of Moonwalking with Einstein or read about it or heard about it? So, okay. Um, so uh, Moonwalking with Einstein is a really great book. It's written by Joshua Four, And he was a journalist. He was not a memory athlete or anything like that. And so the book talks about his uh, journey to become a, a world champion uh, mental athlete memorizing stuff. So he talks about the history of it um, and his participation in it, but he really didn't explain, okay, how do you actually do it? Show me the techniques, explain them to me. How do they work and why do they work? So I've, I've finished, almost finished reading this book. Um, I've taken lots and lots of notes um, on it, but this is the absolute best book on the, on the subject. And if you're into memorization, I'd highly recommend um, this book. I can't stress that enough. Okay, so what exactly is uh, a mind palace? And to understand the concept a little bit better, there's this term in educational psychology called that, that states when memories are formed and for learning is that neurons that fire together, wire together. Now, the truth of the matter, it's not as easy as that. Um, there is a lot of um, analog stuff that happens in the brain, a lot of electrochemical reactions. And, and things like that, and it does occur over time. But the, the concept is to conscript as many neurons as possible in learning and in memorization. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about an urban legend real quick here. Like, have you ever heard the, the, the urban legend that we only use 10% of our brains? I mean, that's been you know going around for, for, for years. Well, like most urban legends, it, it got its start as a fact, and then it got you know, completely twisted out of out of reality, out of its context. But what it really came from is it's a it was a storage um, analysis. The brain scientists have been able to, to dissect human brains and analyze um, neurons, the fundamental unit of storage for for storing memories. And what they found is that amongst all the brains that they looked at, only ten percent of the available neurons were were actively used, meaning. You can go your entire life and have 90% of the storage capacity free, empty. So what that means is that um, for all intents and purposes, your uh, memory is infinite because you're never going to reach the end um, for that. So, you know, don't be shy about conscripting neurons. Use as many as you can. And the way you do that is you can uh, use um, multiple uh, cues and, and modalities, multiple senses. So what do I mean by that? Um, we have our five primary senses, but obviously with virtual reality, we're mainly predominantly focused on the visual. But what is visual? You know, visual is, is depth, it's color, it's black and white, it's movement. Um, and then there's also shadows and the properties of light. And then we also have different, um, you know, audio cues. So, you know, a game engine is a fantastic starting place to do anything in VR simply because you have all of these things um, available to you. So the, the challenge is how do you come up with exotic cues using as many senses um, to fire off as many neurons as possible to help memorize something? And so since you have an infinite capacity, what you'll find is that the, the raw content itself is going to take up a very tiny amount of space but all of the cues and the hooks will take up even more space, which might seem kind of odd. So if you want to memorize something, you mean all the cues take up more space than the content? Yes, and there's nothing wrong with that because the more neurons you use, the easier it is to recall it. And that's really the secret of, of, of memorization is to be able to use as many senses as you can to encode something to make it easier to, to recall. Now, humans are hardwired for navigation, for, for wayfindings, to being able to understand how to get from point A to point B. Um, for instance, all of you in your own homes, you know your home like the back of your hand. You can be tired, you can be sick, you can be stumbling around in the dark, but you know where you where things are in your own home. So the concept of a, of a mind palace is that it is a sequential encoding mechanism. So you would start like, you know, at, at the front door of your of your home. That would be like location number one. And then the, um, you know, your living room could be location number two. And then your kitchen could be location number three. 
And so it's something that you want to memorize. You place it in a sequential manner in those locations, and then you walk through in your mind's eye to each of those each of those locations um, in a logical sequence, step by step, and then also backwards. And using your imagination to not only encode the information, but to also visualize what it's like to see something from a completely different um, perspective. And I'll, I'll talk more about that um, in a moment. So if you've ever heard the expression in the first place, believe it or not, that is an homage to, to a mind palace. So something you probably didn't know about today. And um, again, uh, if you really want to get into memorization techniques and uh, a lot of different uh, ways of, of doing it, like, okay, what technique do I use to memorize like the uh, uh, periodic table of elements? Or how do I memorize names and faces? Or how do I memorize you know, a deck of playing cards? Or how do I memorize pi to a, a thousand places, whether it's you know, text or numbers or uh, any kind of visual thing, or even auditory for that matter? Um, again, Lynn's book and this website, it's not her website, um, will show you these techniques. So the art of memory.com is uh, run by Nelson Dellis. Uh, many of you might not uh, who know Nelson Dellis, but he is a world champion uh, memory expert. I mean, he's won, I think, like three or four world memory champions. I mean, this this is the guy who can memorize a deck of cards in like 30 seconds. And, you know, hundreds of names and faces, multiple lines of, of, of poetry, pages of poetry, and, and things like that. So if you want to have a website to go check out, um, that would be the, the first place to go to go look at. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So one of the issues with, with virtual reality has been cost. It's all about cost, 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 and cost. Virtual reality has been around for tens of years, but unfortunately it's only been available to military and uh, academics. And it's usually very expensive um, equipment that only a handful of people get to use. Um, and that's been unfortunate. And it wasn't until Palmer Lucky started soldering in it in his trailer parked on his parents' driveway that he really brought virtual reality back from the dead into the affordable masses. And it really was the rise of the smart of technology of smartphones that made VR capable and affordable to consumer grade um, virtual reality headsets. It's really hard to believe that we've we're just coming into um, either the end of the fifth or the beginning of the sixth year that consumer virtual reality headsets have been here. So this is still very early for, for mass adoption and you know, even second generation consumer virtual reality headsets are slowly um, coming out. So using a, a game engine, that was a natural fit because originally people say, dude, I wanna play some awesome games in VR. And so a lot of the emphasis you've seen in VR has been on games um, and using a gaming engine, whether it's Unreal Engine, Unity or whatever, um, everybody has you know, changed or added the code that allows virtual reality to work with their particular uh, brand of software. Now, I'm interested in, in the non-gaming uses of virtual reality, whether it's um, used for, for mental health, for treating uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, memorizing things. Um, and so there's a lot, and non-gaming uses is really starting to take off. I mean, you know, Walmart, you know, what is Walmart? What do they care about VR? But they're using it to help train their employees for a lot of different things because VR is a fantastic way to do a training simulation without, um, doing uh you know real world type of simulations and even some of the high-end uh training simulators like everybody knows a, a flight simulator well a lot of the flight simulator software is still very expensive and the fact that now you can use consumer grade vr and deliver a lower cost training simulation experiment is is fantastic okay so i had what i would call a, a near religious experience um a little bit more um a little bit more than a year ago, when I when I first got my Oculus Quest, I was all gaga about this thing, because I was able to um, become a developer and it's free, to turn on developer mode. But then I read this article that you can turn off the Guardian system. Now the Guardian system, uh, you're not supposed to turn it off. Um, they've got a bunch of caveats and addendums about doing so, um, and you can't use it for a commercial purpose and blah blah blah, all this other kind of stuff. But when you turn the Guardian system off, you are not limited by physical distance. So in one of the uh, virtual reality art galleries I built, 
I went to this grassy field and you're not supposed to use the headset in daylight. Um, this is on a cloudy day. So I went to this really large grassy field um, in Colorado. We have soft grass. So I took off my, 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 my shoes and socks. I set my controllers down on the ground, turned off the guardian system and I launched a, an art gallery and I was able to walk through the entire art gallery with just using my feet. And I realized this art gallery was about 300 feet in diameter. And I went up and down each aisle. I could walk straight up to a, uh, a photograph and I could see details that I couldn't see just looking at a computer screen or even a, a, a printed photograph because you can see amazing level of detail when you blow it up life size. And we'll, we'll talk more about that um, in a moment. But that, that was one of these episodic memories. I knew exactly where I was. And it was almost like, you know, magic. I, I couldn't believe it. I've been using this game mechanic um, for a while because I think it is just so compelling. But again, you have to be in a safe area. Um, you need to be aware of what's going on around you. But being able to trick your brain um, was, was, you know, just incredible for me. So I do think we're um, on the cusp of being able to use virtual reality to help people do all kinds of things. Um, like I said, for uh, mental health, for rehabilitation, and for doing new things that is simply not possible. Um, here in Colorado, um, the National Mental Health Innovation Center uses virtual reality to help um, uh, clinicians um, add virtual reality as part of their uh, professional practice. And they're located at the Anschutz Medical Center. This is a multi-billion dollar uh, campus. It hosts the uh, uh, Veterans Hospital, Children's Hospital. It's a teaching hospital. Uh, there's a lot going on at Anschutz. And, um, before the pandemic hit, I was um, uh, uh, talking with them, um, and then we kind of had to, <laughs> everybody kind of had to put their life on hold and pause, um, but I hope to uh, pick things back up once, um, you know, things uh, start turning around a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look at a couple of the, of the mine palaces that I've, that I've built over the years. Um, so these are the three areas we're going to look at, uh, a flow chart, um, something that I call a uh, sequel memorial that I created. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then for my uh, 25th uh, wedding anniversary, I want to do something neat and cool for my wife. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that um, in a moment. So like I said, I work with uh, databases for a living. And so I'm all, all about queries, 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 and queries. And a query uh, reads data or it, it changes data. And every day, this is true, billions and billions and billions of queries are run on database servers around the world. And they all follow this exact, fairly similar uh, pathway. You start in the upper right-hand corner where it says TDS, that's tabular data stream. It goes through a protocol uh, encoding process, and then it jumps over into the relational engine, and then, uh, the way database servers work is if something doesn't exist in memory, it has to retrieve it from disk and then it can use it while it's in memory. So it has to go through the storage engine and then back out and then return it back to the calling application. So, you know, when I was thinking about building a mind palace, I'm like, well, why not start with the flow chart? I mean, because everybody understands flow charts. So what I did is I, I took this and I essentially laid it down flat and then I, I built things on top of it. And so that's, it's a presentation that I've given um, many times, and it's called the life cycle of a query and uh, virtual reality. Uh, so it started off just, you know, fairly simple. Again, this is using uh, Unreal Engine. So each one of those uh, blocks is like a PowerPoint slide, and everything is completely laid out just like the flowchart. So as I'm walking through the flowchart, I'm, you know, explaining to people all the different areas because each one of those sections has a lot of information. And so if you understand the life cycle of a query, it's going to help you with performance and it's going to help you with technical troubleshooting because each one of those areas is, is, a, is a huge subject um, in and of itself. Okay, SQL Memorial. This is something that is a, a personal project to me. And in my professional career, I've known a lot of people. Um, sadly, I've also seen a lot of my friends uh, pass away through health issues, um, accidents, um, just all kinds of things. And I thought, you know, it'd be kind of a neat way to, to honor their memories by building something like a mind palace. And then, you know, and I've been adding to it um, over the years. 
So what you're about to see um, is, is two and a half minutes. Um, so I just ask for your uh, grace and patience um, going through the whole thing. But, uh, you know, for me, this is a, a near and dear project um, to my heart to, to keep the memory of some of my friends and, uh, and acquaintances and even strangers um, alive. So people who have been part um, of our user community. So again, about two and a half minutes. <laughs> Bill Robinson. <laughs> Carter Spade. Ron Germano. Naomi Williams. Aaron Lowe. Robert Davis. Tom Rausch. Mike Wilmot. Larry Toothman. Alan Weber. Bob Grumberg. Kent T. Jones. Ken Henderson. <laughs> Jim Gray. Gone but not forgotten. <laughs> Let the light of their memory burn brightly in us all. Yeah, so that was, um, you know, something, you know, deeply personal for me, but it is, you know, a neat way of using technology to, to honor the memories of uh, some friends and family. So the, the last uh, demo I wanted to show is my uh, 25th wedding anniversary. So um, as this was coming up, um, I told my wife my idea of what I wanted to do. And so she picked out um, a couple of pictures that were uh, near and dear to our heart. And so the actual structure, um, it took a lot of time. I mean, it looks simple on the surface, but it took a lot of time because I wanted to um, display a lot of photographs. And um, so the, the sun is uh, positioned to look straight down. And I use these huge pie shapes. And the, the, the reason behind that is it doesn't throw shadows on any of the pictures. So I don't have to worry about light washing out um, any of the, excuse me, any of the photographs. And it allows me to walk up and down each of these um, aisles. Um, and again, uh, these pictures are, are six feet tall. So I'm able to walk right up to it. I'm talking like, like an inch away from your face. And I can see details that I normally wouldn't see even just looking at a computer screen or even, you know, on, um, on your phone or even through any the, the uh, you know, photo sharing um, apps. And again, this is um, what I used and versions of it to uh, to physically walk through it, just using my feet, not using the VR uh, locomotion, but just with my own two feet. Um, just a quick heads up, um, this might be a little loud. Um, I can't control the volume on it. So um, just a, a quick heads up on that. And this is about um, 30 seconds or so. And this is a, a, a marketing video my uh, daughter helped me, helped me make. <laughs>
so that was a lot of fun to do. I mean, uh, you know, that's about 150 pictures, and uh, they're really I really haven't come across a way of um, having a limitation because um, <clears throat> excuse me, each photograph is, has to be imported in the Unreal Engine as a texture. You then create a material from that texture, and for performance reasons, you want to be sure you're um, observing the power of two, meaning um, I've got to resize it to 2048 by 2048 um, before I import it um, into Unreal Engine. And I use GIMP for that, and we'll talk about some open source tools here. So over the years, uh, some of my observations <clears throat> of building uh, mind palaces uh, for myself and for others is that you do get a lot of overlearning just physically handling the content. Um, so, you know, you're not just memorizing it, but just, you know, looking at it, thinking about it, how do I want to encode it? That's part of the of the learning process as well, and it makes it um, easier to memorize things over time once you have the, uh, the skill set. I'll admit it is very time consuming. Um, if someone says, hey, I'm going to teach you how to memorize a deck of cards, and it's going to be quick and easy. That's not true. Um, memorizing stuff is hard, especially when you have to think creatively. How do I want to use other encoding mechanisms, making something um, a crazy size, making something grotesque, have some emotional uh, uh, action to it? I mean, anything that will make that memory pop for you on the on the encoding process. Well, that takes time to, to think of those things, and most of us, some of us might not think ourselves as being creative, but trust me, we're all capable of coming up with uh, with novel ways of um, of encoding. But again, in that book, um, Memory Craft, she goes into a lot of examples. So you can start with a lot of the stuff that she's done, and then you can tailor it for your own uh, personal needs. I understand not everyone is technical. Folks might be like, well, I want to build a mind palace, but man, I've heard there's a steep learning curve with Unreal Engine or Unity or whatever. I just want to be able to drag and drop stuff. Or and I'm an artist, and I don't want to fiddle with that programming stuff. How do I do it? So there is um, ways of, um, of doing this. So I'm going to go through um, a list of things here. Okay, obviously, first up, I have a preference for Unreal Engine, but you can use Unity, CryEngine. There's a lot of other uh, tools out there. Um, some are expensive. Some are um, uh, moderately priced. Um, some are free. Um, everything that I've built, and this is my, my you know, million-dollar secret, everything I've built, I've always used free tools. I've never had to pay for anything except for some of the uh, marketplace assets, like you saw, like the picture frame. I had to buy that. Um, some of the uh, text, those letters that popped out of the stone, um, I had to buy that. But other than that, I've used free tools um, to build everything that I've ever built with regards to, uh, to mine palaces. Um, if you don't want to learn Unreal Engine, you can still use something called Twin Motion. Twin Motion is a tool used for the architectural visualization space. So it, it doesn't allow you to deploy to mobile headsets, but you can um, use uh, desktop uh, headsets. So, and they've got this huge library, like, okay, I need a tree, or I need a park bench, or I need a window. And so it allows you to just literally, like I said, drag and drop into your environment, and then you hit the button to enter VR mode, and boom, you're now looking at photograph quality, you know, high resolution, something that you threw together in a matter of minutes. Very easy to use, so the beta right now is still free. Um, this other one I just came across, um, Optum. It does cost money. Um, they do have a free trial for it. Um, it, too, uses Unreal Engine behind the scenes, but they've really streamlined the user interface to make it just as easy, like Twin Motion, to just drag and drop, and then, boom, you're doing stuff in VR um, really quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. So all of the audio stuff that I, that I use, I use a program called Audacity. It allows me to do all of my audio uh, recording and editing. And even though these are open source tools, please support open source. Buy a mouse pad, coffee cup, a t-shirt, something. <laughs> these developers are giving up their time. Um, and when you can, you know, toss them some love. Uh, for 3D art objects, I use uh, Blender for a lot of things. Um, I'm not a Blender guru by any stretch of the imagination. I'm still always learning something new about Blender, but they've rechanged their user interface, so it's much easier to use because, trust me, when I'm doing stuff in Unreal Engine, it's like i got to have a completely different mindset on how to switch and do stuff Blender style, and it's like your brain does this disconnect. And um, speculation on my part, I've not signed a non-disclosure agreement or anything like that. It's just me speculating, using my imagination. There will be a day 
when Blender or something like that will be inside of a game engine. So you're not going to have to move stuff back and forth all the time. It'll stay within the engine itself. So you don't have to fiddle with all these file formats and you'll be able to have a single user interface to do all of your work. And then I mentioned GIMP. Uh, GIMP is a, a image editing program. And so that's what I use to do the, the power of two things to change the, the size of the canvas and to change the size of the image before I import it in. And um, Python does have um, some libraries that you can, if you're into Python scripting, uh, both GIMP and Blender support Python. So you want to do some crazy automation stuff, you can do some crazy automation stuff. Okay, and for folks who's like, okay, well, I don't want to learn Blender or, or something like that, what else can I do? Um, on the desktop version of TiltBrush, now this is paid, uh, but it's very affordable. You can build something in TiltBrush, it's a drawing program, and you can export it out, and then you can put that into Unreal Engine, Unity, CryEngine, uh, you name it. Um, same thing with Oculus Medium. Uh, Oculus Medium is a digital clay sculpting program, so what's fantastic about Medium is that um, there's no gravity. Like I can take a, a tiny thin strand of clay and I could stretch it you know, into, you know, into a huge hemisphere above me and it's not gonna fall. It would fall in the real world, but hey, we're in VR. We can do other things like suspend gravity. So same thing, you can build something in Medium and then you can export it out so you can then import it into a game engine. Um, same thing with uh, Quill. Um, this is again built by Oculus um, before Facebook bought them. Um, and they have these things called Quillustrations. And I've seen some fantastic things being done with, with Quillustrations. And those two can be imported in to your, to your engine. Um, so I, I, if, if you need someone to draw a stick figure, I'm your guy. If you want someone to create the next Mona Lisa, I'm not your guy. <laughs> so, you know, you can do things quickly and, um, you know, it, it, it is, um, you know, very uh, intuitive once you get the hang of the, of the tools. Uh, in fact, one of my morning routines is I'll get up in the morning, I'll drink my coffee, put on my Oculus Quest. They have a tilt brush version for the Oculus Quest, the standalone headset, um, and I'll just, you know, play. I'll explore the different brushes, explore the different colors, and just try to, you know, go nuts with my own imagination. Maybe try to draw something that I saw in a dream or something that I just wanted to, you know, see what this thing looks like. All right. All right. So um, if you, if any of you guys and gals are aware, um, Unreal Engine 5 um, is going to be released next year. Uh, it'll, it'll be released to developers um, early next year and then for production uh, use uh, later next year. Um, if you haven't seen the Unreal 5 demo, oh my gosh, take some time to go look at look at the demo. When they say you can drag and drop billions of polygons, they're not kidding. Um, and this is gonna do a lot of things for static uh, objects. Now, I don't know if they can maintain billions of polygons with things that are moving, but in the demo, you're just, it's gonna be jaw dropping photorealistic. I can't believe the level of quality on this stuff. It doesn't even look like you're in a game engine. I mean, it looks like you're on a Hollywood set on a real Hollywood set. It's just so amazing. Um, they've also changed their licensing requirements for revenue. Until you make a million dollars in revenue, you don't have to pay Unreal a penny in royalties. Can you make a lot of money um, under a million dollars? Oh, heck yeah, sure you could. And so my prediction about the future of Nemo Technix um, is gonna continue on the path of virtual reality, but also augmented reality, being able to take a physical object hold it in front of your headset and then have like you know call outs come alive from the object without having to use qr codes you can you know have an object and then you can add certain things to it and as long as it can recognize um that thing you can encode a lot of information into physical objects something that might be um innocuous sitting around your house can store a plethora of, of information and memories and pictures and and things like that. So being able to use augmented reality to encode things um, is gonna be the next uh, chapter that I'm gonna hopefully get into um, soon. Also, um, something I wanna mention are holocrons. Now in the Star Wars uh, movies, no one ever saw a holocron because um, it, it, never, it never existed in the, in the universe. But in the Clone Wars and in other 
shared universes within the Star Wars area, a, a holocron is a, uh, is, a, is a device, it's a memory device. It's an external uh, data storage device, but it contains uh, 3,000 years of uh, both Jedi and then there's a Sith version too. It always gotta have a Sith version, right? Um, 3,000 years of, of Jedi lore, of, of stories, how to build weapons, how to build buildings, um, all kinds of things. So a lot of that information get, was encoded into a holocron and it, and it takes the force to actually open it and manipulate it. So I'm looking forward to seeing you know, what kind of holocrons of the future can people build. Um, and then if you guys are into Superman, the, the comic book character and the, and the uh, series, um, remember Jor-El? Well, he created crystals um, for his son to use that encoded all the information um, about the, the homeworld Krypton and how those crystals were used to build a fortress of solitude. And so I'm kind of working on building my own fortress of solitude with, you know, even more mind palaces building on top of, of existing content. So the question, should mind palaces be taught in schools? If this is such a neat, cool thing, then shouldn't people be learning how to do it? Because if you learn how to wield a skill early enough in school, by the time you reach college, you're going to be brilliant at being able to encode information. Um, so the days of laborious note taking, you know, imagine if you could, you know, attend a lecture, content, whatever, and to be able to real time encode that information into your own mind palace instead of taking notes, reviewing notes, reviewing, reviewing, reviewing. Whereas if you had that skill, you can encode information like it's nobody's business and you'll have it and it'll take less time to review it and to practice recalling it to strengthen those memories over time. And then this last point, um, I think it's important to use the right tool for the right job. Um, in the beginning, um, some of my friends were like, Todd, why do you want to shoehorn a flowchart into virtual reality? This, this makes no sense. Why would you want to do that? Well, you know, so there's a lot of people who are still skeptical about using uh, virtual reality to do everything. It's not a hammer in search of nails. It's, it's, a, it's a right tool for the right application and the right use. And for me and others, using virtual reality and augmented reality to do things with memory and memorization, um, it's really kind of a neat, fun thing to do. Um, again, it's time consuming, but it is a lot of fun and it does keep your mind sharp and it gives you a, a chance to explore your own creativity and your own imagination um, to do things that you might not think you could do. So this is my uh, contact information. Um, if you can spell my name, you can probably find me. Um, I do have my own personal blog on, on WordPress. Um, I'm active on social media, mainly on Twitter. Uh, early in the morning or at lunchtime or in the evening, I try not to be on social media um, during the day just because I've got a, a day job and I need to give my work my, to give them their values of worth. Um, and then again, my email address for, uh, for my uh, one person company, Zone of Hope. So I uh, appreciate everyone coming. Uh, I'll take some questions at this time. Uh, John, do you wanna help me facilitate Q and A please? Yeah, definitely. So thanks everybody for showing up um, just real quick. Basically, what we're going to do is if people have questions, um, go ahead and raise your hand. You have a little raised hand icon uh, down on the right hand side of your screen. And then we'll just open up the stage, take a quick photo, and people can mix and mingle, talk to Todd, ask him questions, whatever. But we really appreciate, appreciate you showing up today. So thanks. So if anybody has, oops, I raised my own hand because I don't want to do that. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll give you the mic. And if not, we can open up the stage. So right now, nobody has their hand up. You should have a raise hand um, icon down on the right hand side of your screen. Here's a couple of questions. So since you are live, go ahead and accept the megaphone. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, perfect. Um... Yeah, so I was thinking about uh, one uh, one thing about the um, memory palace actually, and that had to do with the the time and the effort that it takes to build such a mental uh, palace without VR. Um, 
how do you think that uh, the effort that you put into mentally constructing such a um, memory palace will translate when you already have a virtual um, yeah, setup, basically? So it takes away from the effort that you have to put in, it seems. Well, it, it, believe it or not, it does transfer very well. Um, okay. Even before I got into virtual reality, I was into uh, different types of memorization. And so at that point, um, you did have to just use your own, you know, imagination and creativity and, and think things, think things through. Um, at that time, you know, if you wanted to build something, you had to do something um, using a, a real world asset, like um, your, your, your own home or outside, like a school that, you know, or a place that you might walk or a building or some, some piece of architecture that you could learn very well. And then re using your mind's eye and your imagination walking through those physical places. So that skill set does transfer um, very well into VR. And your brain really doesn't know the difference because it's all in your mind's eye and your imagination anyway. So the skills do transfer. Um, and once you get really good at using uh, mind palaces, uh, you'll be able to do it mentally way quicker than sitting in front of a computer. That's how a lot of the memory uh, competitors um, are able to memorize a deck of cards so quickly. They're not fiddling with anything. They have a system putting it there just on the ground. Yep. How are you? Yeah, next person. I guess I had like a two a question, more just like a comment, maybe a talk after when we were uh, break out. But the uh, uh, question was, I, I noticed uh, some of the images you showed of your memory palaces were kind of more, uh, like there, there didn't seem to be a lot of uh, like specific, uh, like architectural differences as you went through the memory palace. And I guess I was wondering if you'd, if you'd played with, uh, with that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so a lot of the uh, things that I like to do is focus on uh, mobile um, for performance reasons. So you can't have uh, really crazy uh, levels, but on my uh, desktop, whenever I build some things, I can go hog wild nuts and my system can support it. Um, I've done some things with uh, space stations and, you know, like all these hallways and doors that slide open and slide shut, um, things that that pop up a lot of dynamic interactions some particle effects, uh, things like that. So, yeah, so what you've seen, everything has been working on uh, mobile, but some of the desktop versions that I've built, um, I have gone hog wild nuts with them. Sweet. Uh, that, I guess, leads into my second uh, question statement thing, which is uh, that I, I, uh, I worked on a memory palace kind of experiment for three months that I unfortunately never, like, tested, but the idea was to build a memory palace, um, but have it branching and like nonlinear, uh, and to act as like a kind of like a quiz review of practice game. So you could like get given a random concept that you'd learned, have to go to the location in the memory palace, click on a plaque that has like an associated image, and then answer the quiz question, and then like do it all over again. Um, uh huh. And uh, that was obviously one thing I found was the. Uh, uh, obviously performance like I, it's not a quest like you know it's uh, i had to in to to make that happen but uh uh i guess have you thought about any other like evolutions potentially for memory palace as a technique because it's like thousands of years old at this point it seems like and uh i guess maybe this book has answers but i'm curious about uh, any other like kind of new stuff yeah, one of the uh, and you hit on uh, uh, something that um, I've been experimenting with too. I didn't uh, I didn't show it, but um, to uh, flat card like like if you've ever heard of a company called uh, Anki or Anki Software, um, it's a flashcard software. And what's cool about it is that the software uses uh, is based repetition, so it knows um, when to show you something that you're on the verge of forgetting. It's space uh, repetition, so the software helps um, guide you along, so you're not wasting time relearning something that you already know. 
um, but you are spending enough time reviewing things that you you just learned so that you so that you don't forget so uh, one of the ideas that I've, I've I've tried is um so you've seen all the photographs um, laid out so there's an area that I have I call it a control room where um, so I can go through my mind palace I see all the pictures I walk into the control room I push a button and then brrr, all the pictures change to something else and you can do that for for different things like I might say okay I have a picture of something but I want to see other related pictures and so I can have like the picture frame changing pictures of, of, of other things. So it doesn't have to all change at once. It can be just, you know, one that I'm standing um, in front of. In fact, um, that's the next area of development that I'm going to look at is um, uh, Oculus just announced um, the new hands for uh, Unreal Engine. It's going to be incorporated into one of the next hot fixes. So instead of holding up these controllers all the time, you can just use your hands if the sensors can see them. And so that's for me that's going to change a lot of interactions because you know like i said once i can set the controllers down in like a field and just walk around using my feet if i can now use my just my free hands to interact with things that's going to open it up to a new level of uh, of interactivity with regards to building the building mind palaces so long answer to your question but i, I hope that answered it yeah thanks uh anki super interesting I just googled them just now and uh yeah awesome Cool, thanks, thanks. Guy. A couple more questions and then we'll just open this up. Um, Christy, Christy Company, Christy. <laughs> hey, yeah, sorry, my username gets cut off. Um, uh, this is more of a comment, but I just wanted to thank you for covering this topic. I've always found like, memory policies to be Context that existed, but then that idea exists in a larger network of ideas. And so, by being able to recall that one scene or that one idea, you now have access to other memories that were connected to that idea. So, it's like just an ongoing, each memory palace can kind of be part of an even larger network of memory palaces. And I just find that concept really, really cool. Yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right. And um, after building nine mind palaces over time, some of them, um, even though they're not directly related, the fact that they were encoded in such a, a novel, unique way, it does trigger a lot more memories about other things. Like that's always one of the uh, drawbacks to building a mind palace. Like, okay, well, I learned something new. How do I update it? And so do you like, you know, <laughs> put something in the middle of a sequence or do you just, you know, add something to an existing memory? And then uh, it's very similar to what you said. I mean, it's like pulling a, pulling a thread on a sweater um, this memory yeah. will activate this memory, it'll activate this memory. And so, you know, over time, you'll find that a lot of review of some of your mind palaces are going to trigger other memories, um, even when you're not sitting in front of a sitting in front of a computer. And so um, one of the things Lynn recommends in her book, um, and I'm guilty of this too, when you're standing in line waiting for something, what do you see people doing? They're fiddling with their phones. What mm -hmm. if instead you spent some time practicing recall in one of your mind palaces. People might think, well, they're really concentrating hard on something. It's like, well, I kind of am. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And in terms of like how you incorporate the fact that you have multiple references, it seems like if you were actually building a mind palace, say in VR, um, in a spatial location, you could have, um, like for instance, you start in a room inside a house and it's full of all these items with associated memories and you could pick up one item and you have these options of associated memories and you can choose one and then suddenly you're teleported to that scene, that associated memory, which then once you're in that new scene, you have access to all these other memories with other items in that scene. So you've kind of unlocked all the memories associated with that item in the previous scene and then now all the items in this new scene and you can kind of create that network of effect. Yep, and I've I've seen some people try to do 
uh, something similar to that. Like if you've ever seen uh, your own adventure books where it's like, if you make a choice, go here. If you do this, you know, go over here. And so I've seen people take like literally like a page out of an adventure story, turn that into a physical object. And then exactly what you what you just described is being able to say, OK, this one object now gives me access to X, Y and Z. And so it becomes like this uh, breadcrumb of objects transporting you all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> neat stuff. I like it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> cool thing. Thanks, Christy. So we have one more question and then we'll just open things up here. TV producer, you're up. Doing. Um, I was just wondering, I, mean, I haven't mastered this uh, memory thing. <laughs> and I live in Colorado too, and there's a lot of short term memory loss here. Uh, I was wondering, is there a way to capture the information on the screen? Some of the information like presented uh, because I'm wearing an Oculus Quest. So it's a little hard to write it down while you're wearing it. Is there any way? Yes. Thing to... Yeah. So if you want, um, we're actually streaming this to YouTube and probably tomorrow, I'm guessing sometime tomorrow, maybe we'll have it up on the site. Um, actually, I'll probably leave, leave the live stream up so you can go back and replay it. Um, we usually edit it down a little bit, but if you search for like XR creators on YouTube, you'll be able to go through this and you can look at it as you wish. That should work. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody Thank for um, questions. Um, stage is opened up. If you want to um, come up real quick, we'll do our um, requisite photo op. Um, the camera bot up there is um, streaming right now. So if you want to pop up on the stage, we can do some quick a quick round of emojis and then feel free to um, mix and mingle but we really appreciate you stopping by and um, thank you so much todd for doing this this was pretty awesome love the presentation sure. thanks john appreciate it yeah so go ahead camera bots up there if you're in the black area of the stage you should be visible go ahead and throw up some emojis and we appreciate everybody stopping by thanks for coming and oh, oh, I need to unmute everyone. I think, oh, John already did it, I think. So we should be, you should be able to talk with each other now. We're free. True. Free. I unmuted everybody and forgot to unmute myself. There we go. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Todd. That was, that was awesome presentation. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming out. I know you've got a lot of choices what to do with your time. So it means a lot for you guys to take time out of your day to, to come see this. I, I really, um i'm humbled so many people showed up on this on a saturday yeah so we had like um we had probably a pretty consistent sort of even flow of about 25 or 30 during the presentation so it was pretty well attended it was pretty cool yeah yeah hey todd so i have yeah. a question um i sure. think we've been dancing around it a little bit i don't think anybody actually mentioned this topic but like i'm sure everybody's familiar with like mind maps right like that's a thing that i love like in a 2d world and i think yep. christy was maybe kind of kind of like going down the path of mind maps in VR just didn't use the words mind maps but um I mean basically that's kind of what some of what we're trying to what you're trying to do with um with these mind palaces right is kind of create like 3d mind maps in some fashion yep yeah and being able to do that has always been <clears throat> excuse me a challenge because uh creating a three-dimensional version of a of a 2d object um you know, 3D offers um, many more but different possibilities. I mean, uh, one of the things is uh, how do you do text in virtual reality? How do you show a lot of text? Um, is it an actual, you know, is, is it a flat uh, thing like a, like a label or a decal? Or is it like um, a, a, an actual three-dimensional object like, like a sculpted letter or letters or a sculpted word? Um, and then... You know, how do you how do you show that or how do you look at it? Do you, can you see it just from one direction or do you want to turn it into a, a tracking mechanism? Like in Unreal Engine, they have this thing called blueprints and you can create a blueprint that will uh, always make an object face the character. So you could have like a, a huge array of text. So no matter where you are, you're always facing the text, even though you could be walking around different areas. So there's new different things like that on, on how to do it. 
And then also um, navigating um, with VR locomotion, you can, you know, do um, <clears throat> things where you can, you know, jump on like different steps and different levels um, for that. So you have to figure out, okay, how am I going to do locomotion? How are people going to walk around this mind map if I make it really, really big? And then the um, the linking um, of it. So um, this is getting kind of technical, but um, there's this thing called uh, streaming levels. And so what you're able to do is you can have an object that can uh, stream a different level into it. So it can, you know, change the content using everything within a level, but you're not actually um, leaving the main level, if that makes sense. So you can do streaming levels within a level.